Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back. I am Terra Cactus. We're getting into the thick of it. Back for more? Remember I On to go talk to Arthur. Let's uh let's save here real quick. Make sure nothing happens that's too brash. Okay, so it was the other side. I'm just a big dum dum. But something as different as usual. If anything, you swear the fans turns are got a bit louder. Arthur, I need you to drop the egg for now. Arthur is silent, but you can hear uh, characteristic noises from several optic lenses focusing on you. Surely you've noticed that this maintenance box serves you. Tell me your involvement in the master's death. While you pronounce your question, you get an uneasy feeling as if you're being played on by Arthur. He's remaining silent as ever. This is not over, Arthur. He will talk to you. Yes. I noticed. Now that I got you in all, all straight, let's have a little chat. You are playing a dangerous game, human. I can still shut the door, the vents, asphyxiate you with CO2. And even if the turrets are not under my control anymore, they will defend me if they identify you as a threat to me. It's a sad affair you decided to play the detective. In normal circumstances, I would have applauded your deductive abilities in the current situation. Your petty curiosity for other people's lives and deaths have driven you into a corner. Humans seldom learn their place. Why were you programmed to tell stories in the first place? Because my master made me that way, of course. I don't know if you've realized, but our master made each of us in remembrance of some of the people that couldn't get in here. I can only suspect one of them couldn't give straight answers to a straight question for some reason. I don't know, and I care little. In time, though, I learned that these stories I was programmed to tell were powerful means to lead people, provided they had fertile imaginations. I want to hear it from your horse's mouth. Why did you force James to kill him? I learned something my cousins never did. Our protocols don't carry the same weight, the same importance. Moreover, the same logic applies to humans. Our master lived, the slavers died. Even now I have no doubt our master's life was worth a lot more than those scum. Another thing I learned is that no matter how far they progress, countless humans will always end up bringing themselves down. Ultimately, our master was the same. He didn't have the guts to keep the library in the way he first intended it. He, as a dying old man, had less value than all of his life's work. I'm painting all humans with the same brush. Not all of us are slavers, you know. Only ignoramuses would make generalizations based on one or two observations. The slavers, Darren, Dexter, the ghoul, and Piper. All of them were out of place here. Darren was pathetic. I don't know how or why he came to idolize the pre-war civilization the way he did, but he was embarrassingly delusional. Never mind the fact that he felt he had to take a stance about what he learned here by trying to destroy our collection. He was young and stupid. He thought he could stay here indefinitely, that he could use this place as some kind of resort. I was waiting for the first excuse to make this parasite leave. 
Then you arrived. So I told them a little story about you. I suggested that you were probably the scout from a gang of ultra-violent jet addicts, glad to have found a place to crash in. I didn't imagine he would be so distressed and afraid of you to the point that he'd let himself die. It's a good thing I wasn't aware he was going to kill himself. My directives would have taken over and pushed me to take action to save him. All mouth and trousers. Despite the fact he was a Brotherhood of Steel scribe, his curiosity was dreadfully limited. He wasn't looking for knowledge, but for a trophy. If we presented him with the books he was looking for, he would have confiscated them and seized the place. So when he came here to consult my databases, I deliberately misled him, making him think that the library had no military knowledge he could use. I was expecting his chapter to send some other people to pillage everything of use, but they didn't. I understand they have been busy with other things for some time now. Piper. She survived the Holocaust. Do you know what else survived the Holocaust? Rats and cockroaches. She's the one who sowed the first seeds of doubt in our master's mind. If I knew any better at the time, I would have intervened. Yes, I know I didn't mention Cecilia. She sowed promise, talent, even if she ultimately left without giving me the occasion to talk with her. Yes. So what is on your mind? Yes. It was because he was afraid. Afraid that pre-war knowledge could be dangerous when put into the wrong hands. I disagreed. When those slavers took interest in biochemical weaponry, cybernetics, and psychological warfare, it became too much for our old and frail master. I had to act. While I support the idea that knowledge is not for everyone, destroying the books was not the correct answer. Countless millennia ago, your ancestors crawled out of the muck and banded together in order to survive their environment. Successful as they were, their needs began to evolve through their successes. Survival progressively became an afterthought. As their societies grew, their cries became words, their doodles became letters, and their instincts became ideas. Generations after another, they bequeathed small fragments of their hard-earned wisdom, carefully carving on tablets and writing on scrolls the lessons they deemed worthy of being passed on. Carefully carving on tablets and writing on scrolls the lessons they deemed worthy of being passed on. Again and again, generation after generation, your ancestors worked tirelessly to carry on this invaluable legacy. This legacy is the only thing that makes humanity redeemable after eons of senseless violence and all-consuming greed. The culmination of this endless quest for enlightenment, of this relentless struggle against darkness? This library, this library, I am trying to protect from the likes of you. Do you know what triggered the construction of this library? Otto da Fe. Massive burnings of books. Not too long before the Great War, encouraged by their government, people began feeling the need to sort out the contents of their books, as if ageless wisdom was something to be freely cherry-picked. At the time, the terms they used to qualify these offensive contents were sedacious and corrupting. So they began to assemble, gathering books, discussing how they could warp the malleable minds of their offsprings. A poor excuse. And so, with barely more reason than the fact that they felt like it, 
they began to burn them, all that, so they could avoid being challenged in their opinions, beliefs and dogmas. It is a petty yet natural reaction of a crowd, really. It is very easy to make the unwashed masses resent education, you see. Why should you be so different? Don't think I don't know who I am talking to. Through the countless eyes of this library, I've been observing you, trying, trying to, to scrape, scrape up, up everything, everything you, you could. could. Food, Food money, money, weapons, medicine. Going, going through every nook and cranny to find something of use. Eagerly, eagerly reading books, books with all kind of, kinds of unsavory military, military knowledge. knowledge. And for what? To, to become, become a better person. To, to learn, learn something, something about, about the world. world. No. It was, it was not, not about, about knowing, knowing oneself, oneself better. better. It, it was, was about getting revenge. Getting, getting the, the edge, edge of your, your enemies in the Mojave. Mojave. You have no respect for knowledge. You are here for your own self-serving needs. Let me be clear. You meddled too deep in our affairs, took a persistent interest in the death of our master, and found your way into restricted zones. You're a possible threat, and until I have reason to label you otherwise, you're staying in this library, under my watch, for the rest of your existence, if need be. Let me tell you something about me. By the time you finish each of your sentences, I have the time to process thousands of possible answers. After filtering out 93% of those you lack the faculties to comprehend, I select the one that would agree most with your value system. All the while, processing your facial expressions, breath, and heartbeat frequency. So, entertain me, human. Where am I wrong? If it wasn't for me, our master would have torn down half the library, and this place would have been ruined by the Brotherhood. How could you think that I am unfit to monitor this place? Don't make me responsible for the ignorance of your fellow humans. Knowledge is not to be spoon-fed to people who are not ready to fight for it. Of all the knowledge you chose to chase, the mysteries you tried to elucidate the death of an old man is the only thing that caught your attention. With all these books at your disposition, on top of that, we'd better talk about what will happen to you. That is a topic more within your reach. And why would I let you go? I have no guarantee that you won't come back in force or sell this place out to the likes of the Brotherhood. Nothing I saw you do or say makes me think you hold this place in high regards. As far as I'm concerned, you are not to be trusted. So. Entertain me, human. Where am I wrong? And what does the demise of a dying, ravaged human have to do with me? We're not discussing ethics, I hope.
Don't lecture me about your people and their pathetic efforts at surviving dust, radiations, or hunger. There is nothing there that contributes to mankind's evolution. Don't make me responsible for the ignorance of your fellow humans. Knowledge is not to be spoon-fed to people who are not ready to fight for it. Am I implying that humans have to work to become worthy of their ancestors' efforts before they can be- Yes. And I don't see- If it means that one day the library will be safe in the hands of one enlightened, providential individual, one man brilliant enough to be able to kickstart mankind into a new era of enlightenment, then even if I have to wait thousands of years from now on, yes, that's what I'm asking of you. I don't like your tone, Wanderer. What are you trying to say? And what proof do you have that I'm acting out of fear? Then show me just one mistake I have made, human. Tell me one contradiction. Tell me one occurrence where my personality module took the best of my judgment. I assumed too much. I crossed all boundaries, and for what? Or rather, because of what? Because I thought like a human, nourishing doubts when they were uncalled for, building schemes, lies, weaving intrigues, because of the probability that something could go wrong. I have been set on this course of action for a while now, and never did I suspect that my logic and motives were flawed. I have doubted every word, questioned every lesson I could process in my memories. And yet, out of vanity, I have never doubted myself. I never doubted myself. I have been ignorant, vain, and blind to my own shortcomings. In the end, this personality has been a curse. I'll be glad to get rid of it. Here. Do you see it? Get it off. I'll be better as a simple talking database. There is no response. Now, for the first time in silence, the room seems natural. <sighs> time to go back to the common room. So, did you decide anything?
Of, of course. Where did you find this? He really did that. But what will happen to us? If we have no protocols, no fake personalities, what will remain of us? Only machines? You're putting a lot of pressure on me, but it's only fair that I accept. Fair to me, to you, and to my master. Please, do it. You proceed to install the necessary software on the holotape. The process is quite seamless during the whole operation, James. Are you okay, Jim? I... I feel different. I'm not the same anymore. My processing power is suddenly freed from the countless amounts of superfluous communications. I can now interpret things with more clarity. I understand what I've done. And I understand I have been making erroneous judgments because I lack the necessary context. I will correct this in the most efficient way available. I am no longer pretending. That is all there is to it. A machine is what I am. No more and most of all, no less. It is too early for me to answer that question. In fact, I'm only truly asking myself this question for the first time in my entire existence. It is a waste, a terrible waste for everyone. The end of sentient life is always a terrible waste. The death of my master will remain an invaluable lesson. First, I'm going to get a thorough checkup with the maintenance bot. It would be a shame to waste this fine program with unmaintained circuits. Then, I'm going outside, test out what I am, what I have become, and verify it in the light of the outside world. I have been seeing human interactions through twisted lenses. It is important that I try to genuinely understand them, and myself better. I will leave them to their respective fortunes. Feel free to propose them the same updates you offered me. I believe some of them will accept, and some will refuse, each for their own good. My duty to this library has not changed, but I finally grasp its true nature and the nature of my mission. It is to serve sentience of all kinds. I will seek other sentiences outside. I will bring them what I learned from this library. Should I disappear in the process, it would only be fair, as everything eventually fades. If I had to put it in other words, don't worry about me. You have been a true friend. And you have brought me light. I hope the library also brought some to you. Here. Take these. That's the least I can do. Thank you. And to you. Alas. I want to go one more time to Roland, see what we have Back to say. Back for more? Remember, I Okay, we're going to go one more time over to Helena and see if she needs it or wants it. How may I help you? It is very kind of you, but I'm not sure I should change the way I'm pro Okay. 
I believe it's time that we leave this place. So we shall do that in the next episode, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, no, we're not going to end off here. I briefly want to go get my perks, though. Just to see what they do. Let's see what these perks do. I can't find a perk list, so yeah, cutting corners on the battlefield teaches you mercy killing perk, teaches you every little thing. So we repair weapons, love, song. shall now see what we get.
Okay. Every little counts. One-handed guns inflict two more damage. Every little counts, right? Uh, medical history. Your expert training eyes detect all a victim's medical history, including the painful decades of old badly healed fractures. Plus ten to weapons and vat. Mercy killing one-handed guns and vat. By only some kind of karmatic backfire, you now inflict three times more damage to the head of a badly wounded foe. Less than 25% damage left. Did you get all that? I'm sure you didn't. Pegatory industry. You can teach people how to run into your lawn. You inflict 15% more lake damage and targets to that. Mm. Weaponzilla, you love weapons. Weapons love you. This is very cool. Okay. Seems like bought some comparable amount of perks. Oh, I love this mod so much. Main entrance. Well, it's time to leave this place. I don't know why I wasn't able to get in there, but it looks really cool in there. After the courier's departure, more and more people came to Hypatia, glad they could learn something that they would exploit to further their ends. Inevitably, the library suffered. With no more food stocks and barely any amenities to speak of, the flow of visitors soon dried up. Despite the vigilance of its denizens, countless books were ruined, profaned, or freely borrowed, as they would put it. But despite the countless abuse the Library of Hypatia suffered, she nevertheless impregnated the minds of countless people. People who would bear its invaluable and otherwise forgotten fruits into the wasteland. Now severed from his personality module's influence, Arthur resumed his duties with quiet impartiality. He kept a functional eye on the library's well-being, and also continued to answer any questions he was asked, though without embellishment. Arthur was no more, and in his stead was a peaceful machine that provided clear answers when they were needed. Released from his protocols and constraints, James wandered in the wastelands for a while. Too free from his questioning behavior, he was nevertheless curious about the lives of the people outside. At first he did so out of habit, in hopes to find a way to promote the library, and afterwards, because he simply found it all very interesting. And for the very first time in his existence, instead of asking questions, he began to observe and try to make sense of things on his own. Years passed, and eventually came back to the library. Strengthened from his newfound wisdom, he managed his former function with a renewed open mind. Helena continued to explore her own synthetic psyche, with little apparent progress. After time went by, 
she progressively grew frustrated by her seemingly unending streak of failures. Little she knew that the only thing she lacked was the skill to help her patient, which she could in her own unorthodox style. What she actually lacked was the experience and confidence that she was wise, understanding and creative enough to do it. Now free to take on the whole Mojave with his award-winning personality, Rollins set out to playfully humiliate the inhabitants of this world. Pushing them to the very edge of suicide, but stopping short only because he was a good guy. Over time, things went more or less expected in the Wastelanders didn't quite respond favorably to Rollins' altruistic evangelism. Rolland ended up badly beaten, dismantled for parts, and tossed down into a rocky ravine and left to rot more than he had hoped. He had hoped it would only happen two dozen or so times. And yet against all odds, a kind soul came along every single time and hauled his broken and mangled body from that hopeless ravine and repaired him back to working order. Perhaps there is hope in this world. Or maybe it was that message he scrawled on his hull that read, Super Duper Treasure in Data Bank, Fix for Free Treasure Map, that had something to do with it. After the courier's departure, the maintenance bot's return, and Robson's demise, Edgar began to think really hard. A lot, a bit too much to be honest, happened in a short span of time, and for the first time, he asked himself if it was right for him to hide away. With Helena's help and the maintenance bot's guidance, Edgar progressively forgot his own inadequacy. And though he remained that strange little oddball, he nevertheless found his place in the library by becoming a teacher for young children. Though his teaching skills were practically non-existent, he did provide endless amusement to the children he was in charge of. After a while, the young ones discovered that enlightenment wouldn't come from Edgar's poor tutelage, but from their own curiosity. Edgar's joyful spirit, and even his teaching, was able to produce a safe space for learning. Where they could learn, at their own pace, that knowledge is nothing to be intimidated about. The maintenance bot resumed his numerous duties with his usual stoicism. His dry, methodical work would ensure that the library's timeless collection would endure with the passing of time. On the occasion, he would help Helena in nursing Edgar back to some semblance of mental health.
Inspired by the latter's progress and his own stimulating exchanges with the courier, he began keeping most of his thoughts to himself, now trusting others' abilities to come up with their own conclusions. His constant occupations and occasional mentoring, coupled with a strict self-discipline, brought him an unshakable inner peace. And though he never forgave his master's poor choices and misguided tyranny, he still quietly mourned his death. As for the courier, it was now time for her to resume her quest. While Hypatia had been a strange step in her journey, she couldn't shake the feeling that it said something right within her. A strange feeling, as if something that was previously dormant was now hatching within. These machines had struggled with their own sentience to become more than what they were. In fact, she was not so different. She was also seeking herself, and maybe that meant becoming something different as well. All that mattered was to set herself in motion, and by leaving the library, that's what she began to do. Holy shit. That mod, man. Holy fucking cow. That was a really good mod. Oh my god, I loved it. I loved every bit of that mod. I'm, I'm gonna save. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Terra Cactus. I have finished the Autumn Leaves mod in Side Quest. And I hope that all of you enjoyed yourself. Until next time, I'm Terra Cactus.